Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our APEC 201 event. We're going to be answering the question, where are we headed now? And the State Department's Matt Murray is going to answer all of that for us. We're pleased to have Matt here with us from Washington, D.C. to give us the latest on all things APEC. This is our second APEC event, the first one we hosted on February 28th. That video is up on our website, and Japan Society's Larry Greenwood moderated that with Ambassador Kurt Tong and the president of the National Center for APEC, Monica Whaley, uh, who is based in Seattle. Those two spoke, and Larry and Monica are both with us in the audience today, too, so you can ask them questions as well. San Francisco will, of course, host the APEC Leaders Summit for the first time in November, and we have leaders from 21 economies that are going to come to town. Several consulates representing those economies are in the room with us now. We have Canada, China, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Welcome. Welcome to the representatives of the city of San Francisco. Miriam Maduroglu and Maron Foster from the Office of Protocol will be joining us. We have representatives from the Office of uh, Foreign Missions and the Mayor's Office of International Trade and Commerce. We have several community leaders with us, too, and other nonprofit leaders. Welcome to our Asia Society Northern California Honorary Chair, Jack Wadsworth, here in the front row, to our board and advisory council members. Our center recently expanded in the Pacific Northwest to include Seattle, and we have our friends from Washington State joining us virtually online, too. And a big thank you to Chevron for supporting us in this event. Uh, also, for all of you for traveling out here, we have Albert Williams from Houston, Texas. We have Bryant Chablis from D.C. and Kurt Glaubitz, who used to be based here in Northern California, who has moved to Singapore. Thank you very much. We can't do it without you. I'm Margaret Conley, the executive director of our Northern California Center. Our speaker bios are on our website, the Northern California website. You can check that out. For our format, Matt Murray's going to come up and give a presentation. He'll have slides. He is our special guest and the U.S. senior official for APEC. He's in charge of everything APEC. He also oversees the Office of Economic Policy in the State Department's Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. So anything that's going to happen in Seattle, San Francisco, and everything in between, he will have the the answers to. At our last event, the follow-up requirement was to bring Matt Murray to San Francisco, and we we're pleased that we were able to do that. After that, we're going to have a moderated discussion with the former ambassador to Indonesia and Myanmar, Scott Marcial. He's going to lead a moderated discussion. He's now a fellow at Freeman Spogli at Stanford, and we will have time for audience Q&A after that. So if you have questions, please get them ready. We'll have microphones. Raise your hand. Scott will call on you, introduce yourself, make your questions brief so we can get to as many as possible. Uh, please take a moment to silence your phones. This is on the record, and we are recording, and we will end at 6.30. So let's go ahead and welcome Matt Murray for the keynote. Well, thanks, Margaret, very much for the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, it's true, I have uh, all the answers until the first questions start, uh, and then it gets a little bit trickier, right? So, but that's why we want to have these kinds of opportunities, especially with uh, the Asia Society, uh, which has been already a great partner in uh, our APEC host year, uh, as they are every year. Um, but uh, this is my second Asia Society event this year. I did one in, in New York uh, earlier in the year in January, and it's really a pleasure to be here at the Asia Society in, in Northern California, so thank you. Um, and, you know, what we do want to try to do today and tonight is uh, just what Margaret said, to sort of give you an update on where we are now in our APEC host year and to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities uh, we see ahead. Um, we are very excited uh, to be hosting APEC in the United States in 2023, um, which, uh, as I think all of you know, is, is a full year's worth of meetings and interactions, including among leaders, ministers, senior officials, subject matter experts, and key stakeholders among the 21 uh, Asia-Pacific economies that together account for uh, roughly half of the world's trade. Uh, San Francisco, as the host uh, city of the APEC 2023 Leaders Week, uh, will serve, we think, as a very fitting backdrop for so many of the goals for our host year, from green jobs of the future to the digital economy to economic resilience and recovery. 
And we know San Francisco will be an outstanding host uh, for the APEC leaders meeting. And I know that our friends from the Office of Protocol will be here in a bit, but just to say uh, they've done a phenomenal job of, of getting ready for uh, the Leaders Week in November, and we look forward to continuing to work with Miriam, Marin, and their teams um, as we go forward. San Francisco, of course, is home to uh, a very large Asian American uh, population uh, and as a key, is a key destination for a lot of the foreign direct investment from, a from the Asia Pacific. Uh, Northern California businesses uh, sell around $60 billion of goods and services to the APEC region. And San Francisco, uh, as was referred to a moment ago, also is home to over 75 uh, consulates along with so many trade commissions. So very grateful to all of you who are here tonight uh, from the private sector and from the consular community. Um, it's, it's terrific to have the opportunity uh, to talk to you. So our team was here just a few weeks ago, uh, you know, working on preparations for November, and just so impressed, again, by the city's capacity and the global scale to accommodate uh, APEC 2023 with great facilities, including the Moscone Center, uh, where both the gathering of leaders from APEC economies will take place, as well the a uh, the APEC CEO Summit. And terrific that Monica Whaley could be here from the National Center for APEC, uh, as her team is really working so hard to put together the CEO Summit part of that program. And uh, you know, we really see, Monica's tired of hearing me say this, or maybe she's not, um, you know, public-private collaboration in APEC is really uh, the secret sauce, in my view, of what makes APEC work, uh, because it is a place where uh, government and private sector can work side by side uh, on uh, all of the things that our economies care about, uh, creating jobs and advancing economic prosperity around the region. So really uh, a, a privilege to be able to partner with Monica and her team on that. And I think, you know, as we've talked in my office about this, of course, the State Department, uh, we're used to going off to someplace far away and, you know, uh, living, working, serving uh, at an embassy or a consulate uh, or, you know, being in Washington, D.C. and taking uh, a quick trip uh, to Asia or Europe or wherever it is. Uh, but one of the real privileges, I think, of being U.S. senior official for APEC uh, during an APEC host year is we get to see our own country, right? And so that opportunity um, to hear firsthand from uh, people here about the challenges and opportunities that you see and the ways that we can advance that in a very, uh, you know, in a, in a real way uh, through APEC and these types of organizations um, and addressing the challenges that you face, I think is a really uh, tremendous privilege and opportunity. Um, I've often reflected over the last few months that uh, I wish I had had more of those chances earlier in my career because I think I would have been a better diplomat uh, if I had had more opportunities to engage local communities. So as I told um, the Honolulu Star Advertiser during an interview in December, you know, we don't want to just be the State Department and the APEC team coming into a place. Um, you know, it's not really worth anything if we're not supporting our communities, our constituents, and our people. And so that's something that we've really tried to reinforce with our team uh, as we've gone through this year. And our goal in APEC, very succinctly put by Secretary of State Blinken uh, last November, is to meet the moment that we're in. Uh, to ensure our efforts in this multilateral economic organization of 21 economies deliver strong outcomes at this very unique time in our history for communities around our country, like San Francisco and the entire Bay Area. So I'm going to get into a little bit of a review for those of you who know, very familiar with APEC, or perhaps some information that's new for those of you who might be less familiar, um, so that we can try to uh, follow uh, Margaret's charge to sort of go from the 101 to the 201 or something on, on APEC. So just to recap uh, for some of you, APEC was launched in 1989 as a consensus-based non-binding economic organization with members on both sides of the Pacific Rim uh, to promote economic and trade cooperation, not only between governments, but with input from a broad array of stakeholders, including the private sector. In 1993, during the first U.S. host year, APEC was elevated to a leaders level forum, and then President Clinton hosted the first APEC leaders meeting in Blake Island, Washington, near Seattle. APEC has been a forum where economies have gathered to address many of the key policy, economic policy challenges over the past three decades, including the economic aftermath of the Asian financial crisis of the late 90s, uh, September 11th, the global financial, financial crisis, and most recently, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. I first learned about APEC as an intern in Jakarta, Indonesia in 1995, 
one year after Indonesia had hosted APEC and launched the BOGOR goals to promote open trade and investment in the Asia Pacific region. I later had the opportunity to work on APEC during my State Department career in 2011 and 2012, including when the United States hosted in 2011, and at that time launched important work on women's economic empowerment, green growth, regulatory convergence, and economic integration. From these opportunities, I learned that APEC could be an excellent platform both to address economic challenges on a multilateral basis, as well as a great convener to bring leaders and ministers together to meet bilaterally and solve problems as well. And sometimes it's that second part that ends up becoming the most noteworthy coming out of any summit. So today, the 21 APEC economies account for half of global trade and approximately 60% of the world's GDP. And for the United States, the APEC region accounts for 60% of total exports and seven of our top 10 export destinations. APEC economies also in total have invested $1.7 trillion in the United States as the current stock of FDI. And as you saw from the organization's membership on the previous slide, some of our closest partners and friends like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan are APEC members, as are emerging Asian economies like Singapore, Vietnam, Indonesia, Korea, and Malaysia, as are Latin American partners like Chile and Peru, as are countries where we have more challenging relationships like China and Russia. APEC also is one of the few multilateral organizations where Taiwan participates as a full member under the name of Chinese Taipei. The APEC calendar, which I'll discuss in greater detail in a few moments, provides opportunities for, to engage with all of these economies at multiple levels over the course of nearly 300 meetings each year, including workshops with subject matter experts, senior officials meetings, as many as 10 ministerial meetings, and the leaders meeting in November, as well as key opportunities, as I've said, through the year for uh, public-private collaboration. Our office, the Office of the U.S. Senior Official for APEC at the State Department, coordinates this work across the interagency as more than a dozen U.S. departments and agencies are engaged in delivering outcomes throughout each year-long process, including engaging relevant stakeholders. And while our office has remained very busy in the recent past, uh, you would be forgiven, however, if APEC's work had been out of sight, out of mind uh, for the past few years. APEC struggled to deliver outcomes in 2018 and 2019 because of geopolitical challenges during Papua New Guinea's host year in 2018 that prevented consensus from being reached on the leader's declaration, and domestic political challenges in Chile in 2019 that prevented the leader's meeting from being held. As it did for so many other things, COVID-19 took APEC online in 2020 and 2021 during Malaysia's and New Zealand's host years. And it was only last year that APEC was able to return to in-person meetings in Thailand. But of course, 2022 started with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which prevented significant challenges for APEC given Russia's membership in the organization. But despite these challenges, uh, APEC has delivered some important outcomes in the past three years, which are up on the slide. In 2020, Malaysia led APEC economies to launch the Putrajaya Vision 2040 for an open, dynamic, resilient, and peaceful Asia-Pacific community by 2040 for the prosperity of all of our people and future generations. In 2021, New Zealand launched the Aotearoa Plan of Action to set out actions to achieve the Putrajaya Vision and evaluate progress. And importantly, these efforts in 2020 and 2021 also made very clear the three drivers of economic growth on which APEC should focus, trade and investment, innovation and digitalization, and strong, balanced, secure, sustainable, and inclusive growth. In 2022, Thailand added momentum to APEC's work on sustainable growth by launching the Bangkok Goals on the Biocircular Green Economy, which embedded sustainability principles across all of APEC's work streams. So the White House raised its hand to host APEC in 2023 during Vice President Harris's trip to Singapore in August 2021. So a bit late in the game, but uh, uh, that announcement was made in order to both demonstrate US leadership in the region through our engagement and to deliver concrete economic policy outcomes. And we see hosting APEC as an integral piece of the prosperity pillar of President Biden's Indo-Pacific strategy, which was launched in early 2022. Despite the short runway available for, uh, to us to prepare to host an event of this magnitude, which happens in five different cities across 12 months, including a leader's week, 10 ministerial meetings, four senior officials meetings, and nearly 300 workshops and working level events, 
uh, as well as stakeholder engagements, we want to leverage our APEC opportunity for both foreign policy and domestic gains, advancing an international economic policy that boosts prosperity both at home and in the region. We want to be a good steward of APEC and build on the work of the past few years that I've just highlighted, as well as on the three plus decades of APEC's successes. As such, the theme of our host year is creating a resilient and sustainable future for all as we aim to build an interconnected, innovative, and inclusive Asia-Pacific region. This theme and objectives uh, very much seek to build on the Putrajaya Vision 2040, while also delivering the results the, the region needs right now in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. To flesh out the agenda a bit more, each of the priorities includes many lines of effort. Uh, which are led within the U.S. government by different departments and agencies in a whole of government approach. So building a resilient interconnected region that advances broad-based economic prosperity includes um, strengthening supply chain resilience, enhancing services trade, promoting digital trade, restarting cross-border travel, enhancing infrastructure and transportation networks, strengthening health, health systems, implementing the free trade area of the Asia-Pacific Work Plan, which has been a long-time effort in APEC, and supporting the WTO as an institution. Enabling an innovative environment for a sustainable future includes enhancing climate mitigation and resilience, reducing disaster, ri disaster risk and improving emergency preparedness and response, promoting the digital economy and enhancing digitization, promoting food security, food safety, and agricultural biotechnology, tackling environmental challenges and fostering an enabling environment. And affirming an equitable and inclusive future for all includes advancing gender equity, strengthening SMEs, addressing inclusion and trade, expanding economic potential and opportunity through investments in infrastructure and workers, elevating workers' voices, and engaging historically underserved and underrepresented segments of the population. For each of the above priorities and lines of effort, there are multiple engagements and policy initiatives um, that uh, are planned throughout the year to aim for progress in each area. The advantage, of course, of hosting is you have the opportunity to set that agenda in a very proactive way uh, as you lay out the calendar of events. So almost immediately, um, uh, so again, I want to share where we've been and where we're going, I think, uh, on the calendar. But you know, almost immediately on the heels of the APEC Leaders uh, Week in Bangkok uh, last November, we hosted our first meeting, which was the three-day informal senior officials meeting in Honolulu in December of last year. Honolulu had hosted the, lead the APEC Leaders Meeting in 2011, and so it was nice to be able to uh, pick up where we left off, uh, particularly by highlighting some of the progress uh, made in two key areas from our 2011 host year, which were green growth and women's economic empowerment. The Hawaii program also featured a public facing element, uh, an APEC symposium, and a visit to a local middle school. Our engagements in Honolulu reminded us why we're hosting APEC in the first place, uh, to benefit Americans as well as uh, communities across the Asia Pacific region. It was very evident that hosting APEC isn't really worth anything if we're not uh, supporting or listening to our communities, our constituents, and our people. So we carried that spirit forward to the first senior officials meeting, or we refer to them as SOMS. Uh, so SOM 1 um, in Palm Springs in February, uh, which was another success thanks uh, to our strong US government interagency counterparts, as well as uh, all the private sector stakeholders representing the diversity and strength of American businesses. We welcomed 1,300 delegates from the 21 member economies to participate in meetings on a wide range of topics across a two week period further honing in on the theme and priorities for our host year. Psalm 1 featured more than 100 workshops, dialogues, and official APEC meetings covering a broad range of topics. And you know, APEC, again, is a whole of government effort, and we were definitely reminded of that during Psalm 1, as over 200 US government officials from the White House and 12 agencies were in attendance as a moderator, a speaker, a presenter, and or a workshop organizer. We also hosted uh, in Palm Springs the APEC Finance and Central Bank Deputies Meeting, which kicked off the APEC Finance Minister's process in 2023. And beyond the meeting rooms, we also arranged an array of field trips and excursions to demonstrate the breadth of work we are already doing in the United States that aligns with our APEC priorities, such as uh, US public and private sector policies and best practices in action. APEC members expressed broad support for the U.S. host year goals, especially our particular focus on implementing APEC's recent high-level uh, vision statements um, in a robust ministerial process 
as well as work on supply chain resiliency, the digital economy, inclusive economic growth, including women's economic empowerment, and the resumption of safe cross-border travel following the COVID pandemic, as well as U.S. efforts to expand APEX outreach to the private sector and other stakeholders. Uh, we successfully hosted SOM2 in Detroit from May 14 to 26. Again, feedback from other APEC economies on our policy priorities and the warm reception they received in the city uh, has been very positive. Detroit's story of economic revitalization, transformation, and resilience served as the perfect backdrop to underscore the United States priorities for our APEC host year. More broadly, Detroit showcased our substantial cross-border trade with Canada, worker-centric trade policies, and advanced manufacturing base, making it a perfect venue to highlight economic inclusion and innovative growth. Thanks to the leadership of Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg uh, as the 2023 Transportation Ministerial, uh, the first time APEC transportation ministers had gathered since 2017, ministers and stakeholders discussed supply chain resiliency and connectivity, address, addressing transportation's role in tackling the climate crisis, and promoting inclusivity and accessibility. The Transportation Ministerial focused uh, more on hearing the voices of stakeholders through key activities, uh, including a panel discussion on minority bank financing for electric vehicle infrastructure and purchases featuring Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan, an APEC Green Maritime Collaboration launch event, and the APEC 2023 Private Sector Host Committee's welcome reception. The ministers responsible for trade meeting was also a success along with discussions on supporting the multilateral trading system uh, with the WTO Director General in attendance. Ambassador Catherine Tai also uh, uh, carefully listened to what small and medium-sized enterprises need uh, in order to advance the administration's worker-centric trade policy, uh, demonstrating U.S. leadership to foster sustain sustainable trade. Um, there were also several working groups on human resources development, food safety, energy, and transportation, uh, where uh, the U.S. government, agencies, and senior officials closely collaborated with civil society and advocacy groups uh, to achieve progress in those areas. Um, and of course, we also, again, in Detroit, partnered with the APEC Private Sector Host Committee, uh, the U.S. APEC Business Coalition, the City of Detroit, and local government and elected officials in order to engage a wide range of stakeholders on the margins of those meetings. Um, and throughout SOM2, we attempted to lift the efforts of APEC's working groups to be responsive to stakeholders and drive forward on practical solutions. And in the senior officials meetings, we also introduced a working paper on what we call the Digital Pacific Agenda, uh, which we want to uh, really try to move forward on over the next several months as we head towards San Francisco. Uh, Psalm 3, our next set of meetings will be in Seattle, Washington uh, from July 29th to August uh, 21st. And um, I won't go into too much detail here on, on Seattle, um, but you know, Seattle is going to be the venue for uh, six different ministerial meetings. Uh, on disaster management, on health, on food security, on energy, small and medium-sized enterprises, and the Women in Economy Forum. And uh, we also feel like Seattle will be a great backdrop to focus on uh, digital economy issues. And uh, for the first time, we're going to be organizing a series of events around the digital economy uh, in an APEC digital month uh, to try to get at some cross-cutting um, you know, outcomes that we can again drive forward on towards San Francisco. And so uh, we look forward to releasing a calendar soon on what APEC Digital Month will include in Seattle. Um, and so that brings us to uh, really the, the key, I think what everybody wants to hear about here in San Francisco is, is what's gonna be happening during APEC Leaders Week. And uh, I did see uh, Miriam uh, just came in from the Office of the Chief of uh, Protocol for the City of San Francisco. Uh, she and her team have done a tremendous job um, in just getting ready for the, uh, for the event. So if you wouldn't mind helping me give them a round of applause for all the work <laughs> that they are doing and, and, and will be doing, I, I know, over the next few months. But, um, but look, I think even you know, most observers, including even the most enthusiastic APEC watchers, uh, will not really focus their attention on APEC um, in the organization until the APEC Economic Leaders Week uh, right here in San Francisco during the week of November 12th. And during that week, senior officials, foreign and trade ministers, finance ministers, and leaders from uh, the APEC economies uh, will be hosted by President Biden uh, for the final meetings of the APEC year. And in addition to government officials, there also will be a high-level business representation at the APEC CEO Summit that I mentioned earlier and the inaugural uh, Sustainable Future Forum, which is something that we're introducing this year in APEC uh, to encourage uh, public-private collaboration on sustainability issues, um, as well as the final meetings uh, of this year's APEC Business Advisory Council, 
um, which also will make uh, recommendations to leaders. And this year is chaired by East West Bank CEO uh, Dominic Ng. You know, our goal for November will be to deliver an ambitious set of economic policy outcomes based on engagements throughout the year, as I said, to meet the moment that we're in. Those tangible outcomes remain a work in progress uh, and will be the result of some energetic diplomacy in the coming months. But I think it's really important that in addition, you know, we have all the work streams that I mentioned earlier, just to note that we'll not only need to be able to deliver on specific priorities, but also aim to deliver on cross-cutting objectives. For example, whether that's on improving sustainability inclusion or on developing the digital economy uh, or ensuring economic resilience across the APEC region. So we look forward very much to working with uh, APEC partners over the coming months uh, to try to move forward in those areas. So really, I know we want to get to the discussion uh, here in a moment. Um, but we do hope, uh, we, you know, big goal of us wanting to travel out here, especially prior to November, is to connect with as many as you as, uh, of you as possible. I've had two great days out here in the Bay Area doing a number of different events. And, you know, we really do want you to sort of follow the story, especially particularly given that uh, San Francisco will feature prominently uh, later in the year. So through uh, our LinkedIn site, um, through our website, uh, I've also, there's a couple of folks from my team who are here, Sue Ku, who is our stakeholder engagement lead, sitting back there, and Clara Perrin, our communications lead. Um, definitely hope you'll get a chance to talk to them. And, but I look forward to the discussion, look forward to the Q&A. Um, please do ask uh, all the hard questions, uh, happy to, to give it a shot. Um, but also beyond this room, I mean, I hope that all of you as opinion leaders will consider, you know, your own views on, on what APEC should look like in San Francisco in November and that you'll uh, contribute, whether that's through op-eds or uh, other, other means to be able to um, really feed into uh, that feedback loop as well. Um, I've been very fortunate to be a State Department Foreign Service Officer for 25 years uh, with experience working in, on these issues both overseas and in Washington. And so the most exciting thing to me about um, you know, APEC is that I believe it's a forum where we can tie together, I can tie together a lot of these experiences of living and working on economic policy in the region and bring those experiences together in a, in a meaningful way. I think engaging multilaterally can be very difficult at times, uh, but I also believe it's the best way uh, to address complex problems uh, because I think when we get regional, we get real. And so, uh, you know, importantly, as I said earlier, though, uh, APEC also will be a place, provide an opportunity for bilateral engagement with key economic, uh, e um, key economies in the region uh, at the highest level. And so we look forward to San Francisco being a place where uh, all that can happen. So in, ad in addition to serving as a great platform uh, for diplomatic engagement, uh, APEC will be most meaningful if we also deliver positive outcomes both here at home and in the region, because ultimately that's the standard on which our efforts will be judged. So thanks very much for the opportunity to share a bit tonight, and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. And um, we do have Miriam here. We would like her to say a few words before we go to this discussion. So get your questions ready. But before we invite Scott up here, she connects. And go ahead and take a seat, uh, Matt. Please do sit, sit in the spotlight. Sit in the spotlight. OK. She connects the mayor with the representatives of foreign governments, including over 70 consular coordinations in 18 to 19 sister cities of San Francisco. Eight of those are in Asia. Please welcome the city's chief of protocol, Miriam Maduraglu. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And, uh, um, thank you, Matt. It's been nice to uh, be uh, meeting with you and, and uh, working with you and the entire team. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Miriam Maduruglu, the Chief of Protocol for the City of San Francisco, and I'm delighted to speak with you all. Um, and San Francisco is honored to be the host of Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation uh, coming up in November, November 12th to 17th. I'm sure you have all, that date by now um, memorized in everyone's heads. Um, and as a San Franciscan, I should say that it kind of makes sense for us to be uh, given this honor to host this event. We are a global city. 
with many cherished cultural uh, organizations and institutions and connections to many of the APIC members' economies. 15 of the 21 economies are actually represented here in San Francisco. Our population of 33% Asian, we claim to have the oldest and possibly the largest Chinatown in the US, which was established, as you know, in 1848. And we have a large representation of entrepreneurs and investors represented in the world from the world since 2018. And more, more than half of that have been just here uh, in San Francisco and ventured from the Bay Area. And San Francisco has made a commitment to exemplify the core themes of APEC being inclusivity, innovation, and sustainability. We proudly have racial equity a priority across all city government departments. And as a hub of innovation, San Francisco has attracted the greatest amount of venture capital investments in the US, thinking about the 90 billion in 2018, according to Bloomberg. And we are well known for leading the way toward a zero waste economy, having created one of the first citywide composting and recycling programs, diverting 80% 80, 80 of the city's waste from landfills, among and many other made initiatives and programs to address climate change. So San Francisco has also been known for its resilience, innovative thinking, and inclusivity in how we have thoughtfully and creatively responded to the big challenges and big issues of the day, post-pandemic, economic recovery, housing challenges, and social justice issues. And these are challenges that are not unique to our city, but truly reflect this particular historical moment. So we are also very proud of being a city that enables creation with new movements from the digital revolution, green tech, the AI uh, movement and all that is being created uh, right here in our city by Pier 70 and be, uh, beyond 11 different AI companies that are just being born from the city itself. Uh, the launch of autonomous vehicles. These are all incredible uh, movements that are coming and being born right here from our city. And we, we are excited to be part of this a solution as APEC and the economies involved are participating here in our city. Um, APEC is all about coming together from cross cultures and from different economic viewpoints to find common ground and to solve global challenges and to improve the quality of our partners. And this is what I, what we, were we excited for San Francisco to be part of the solution, be part of the, uh, challenge and be working with uh, uh, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation uh, uh, Partnership. So we look forward to November and we look forward to working with Matt and the team and uh, we welcome any um, partnership on your behalf. Thanks for that, Matt. Um, for those who didn't get, I'm Scott Marcial, uh, and uh, thanks to Margaret and Asia Society for giving me a chance to, to join and to throw a few questions uh, Matt's way before we open it up to questions for the audience. Uh, Matt, you talked a lot about the, the vision, various vision statements, but also about the importance of, of out, tangible outcomes. Um, you know, the, the focus, to the extent the media is focusing on APEC, as you said, they're going to focus on the leaders. What do the leaders say? Do, do various people shake hands and smile at each other? Those sorts of things. But on the practical outcome side, I wonder if you could offer just your, your thoughts on what APEC in the last, let's say, three, three to five years, some, some real practical, tangible outcomes that you think have actually affected communities. 
Yeah, thanks very much. Um, you know, I think that that's uh, one of the pieces that we're really trying to, you know, revitalize some of that because I think the last three to five years, and we heard this from a lot of our APEC partners when we first started hosting, is they said, look, we have enough vision statements, right? Yeah. We, we need to implement, we need to do some things. And I think there are people that when they go back to APEC's history, they look at ways in which APEC, APEC helped uh, really uh, start off the information technology agreement that eventually went to the WTO, started the, uh, oh, the work on environmental goods and services. You know, right here in San Francisco, uh, Secretary Clinton launched the Women in Economy Forum in September of 2011. So there, there have been good examples in the more distant past and maybe uh, fewer examples in the more recent past. Um, I think the good news as we come into our host year is, is, is there's a few things. Um, one is I think that coming out of the COVID pandemic, uh, you talk to other APIC economies, they all have very, very similar stories to tell about the challenges that they're facing at home. So when it comes to economic recovery, they also are dealing with the transition from, you know, back to in-person work, and they've got problems with rents, and they've got problems with transitioning people from the informal economy to the formal economy. They've got problems accessing supply chains. They, you know, a lot of things that are very familiar to us here in, in the U.S. I think there's also a really strong uh, view across the region about the need to be more sustainable and to really uh, to address the climate crisis to advance sustainability. And that was a big part of what Thailand did uh, last year. Um, in, uh, in launching the biocircular green economy. And so I think, you know, when we look towards uh, outcomes uh, for the year, I think there has to be, you know, a set of outcomes that's around sustainability and around green economies of the future. And I'm very confident that as we talk to a lot of our APEC counterparts, that that will be something that could be very lasting um, from our host year. And again, uh, San Francisco will be a perfect backdrop for that. Um, the other thing we hear from pretty much every stakeholder we talk to is that you have to do something to uh, bring APEC economies together around the digital economy. Um, whether you are a business or civil society or student or university or whatever, um, you know, digital economy does not equal necessarily just big tech. It basically impacts everybody, right? And so that's also true across um, the APEC region. Uh, the tougher part for APEC, though, is if you took a poll of the 21 economies of what a, a healthy digital economy looks like, you'd probably get 21 different answers, right? And so that, to me, is a reason where APEC can play an important role in helping to, to shape that. But we really want to dive into to those issues. And I think thirdly, uh, it's really an imperative coming out of the COVID pandemic that we do address uh, some of the challenges around economic resiliency, um, which I think is something that APEC does very well because we have discussions around you know, good governance and good regulatory practices, anti-corruption, supply chain resilience, a lot of these issues. So um, it's gonna be a lot of work, I think, over the next few months to, to drill down into some very specific things there. But I think we've been able to create a, um, a, a series of events which hopefully will help us do that. Okay, thanks. You know, APEC, it seems to me that a lot of its success, with all due respect to the leaders' meetings, has come from, you know, the senior officials' meetings, the hundreds of meetings a year that you come. People looking at things from a technical, uh, uh, I wouldn't say non-political point of view, but not focused on geopolitics, but sort of, hey, let's get this done kind of uh, approach. Um, the world we live in today, we all know the Asia Pacific region, it's pretty fractious. It's probably more divided than it's been in a long time. So how possible is it, this is one of these impossible questions, but how possible is it for, for you and your counterparts to get together and, and work either beyond or beneath um, this sort of geopolitical tension to get pra agreement on practical things? Yeah. Well, I do think that one of the great things about APEC, again, is, is that sort of bottom-up element, right? That you do get a lot of experts in the room from around the region to talk about a whole range of, of different kinds of uh, topics. Um, they have this whole working group structure. Those working groups report up through senior officials and to the ministers. And in many cases, there's a, there's a ministerial meeting that, you know, like we're going to have an energy ministerial meeting that was supported by energy working group. We just had the transportation ministerial, which is supported by the transportation working group. And so um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, work that goes on at the experts level that, that can, I think, get around and get past uh, some of that um, 
the geopolitical uh, differences. Um, I think uh, one of the great things about APEC, again, is that we are able to, because it's a consensus-based, non-binding organization, we're able to air a lot of our differences uh, in front of you know, everybody in the room. Um, if, uh, from the U.S. perspective, we have a difference with uh, any of the other economies, we have that opportunity uh, to really raise that and explain why. I have found, particularly in the current environment, that from the U.S. perspective, the most helpful way to approach it is to say that we want to support APEC as an institution and we want to support international rules and norms. And to the degree that we're pushing back on any one economy, um, that that's the reason why we're pushing back, because we feel like um, you know, that, that economy is not supporting APEC as an institution or not supporting uh, international rules and norms. I think as the U.S. host, that's been a, a more effective strategy than trying to you know, basically get in a fight with you know, whoever uh, is raising the issue. I do think the one geopolitical issue that certainly uh, makes things complicated in APEC right now is Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, and the ongoing war there, because that does create an environment where we're trying to get things like consensus statements and we keep getting bogged down in discussions around the impact of the war on the region's economy and that sort of thing. So that's a tough one, and you can't really you know, sugarcoat that. But um, I think in large part, um, yeah, cautiously optimistic that we can work through some of those issues and get to uh, some, some you know, real outcomes. Great. So the next question is really a follow-on, and, and I'm going to phrase it in two different ways, and you can answer whichever one works for you. Um, for you as U.S. senior official, what, what, what the day after the leaders summit, leaders meeting ends, what outcomes would you see that would make you walk away feeling it was successful, specifically? Or the second way of putting it is what areas of convergence do you think are most likely in terms of, of agreements that could be announced? So I think, first of all, I, I want to be a little bit broader for a second, uh, because I think it's an uh, important starting point, is that um, the first thing, and this is going to sound, uh, um, I don't know, trite, but it will be great when it happens, like that the meetings happen, that, that we're able to actually be a convener, uh, that we're able to demonstrate leadership in the region by bringing all of these leaders and ministers to San Francisco, uh, and to be able to have some good engagements as a result of that. Um, and I think the reason that's important is, you know, it was not so long ago when there were lots of questions about, you know, is the U.S. engaged, you know, showing leadership in the Asia Pacific? Is the U.S. Uh, engaged economically in the Asia Pacific? So to be able to have something tangible that we can point to, that we can say, hey, we brought this, you know, huge gathering of leaders and ministers to San Francisco. We had successful meetings. Uh, we opened up doors for diplomatic communication. Uh, I don't think that's a small thing. I think that's important to be able to say, hey, we had a great, uh, a great leaders week and that um, you know, everybody successfully came and, 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 and that, that was an accomplishment in, unto itself. I think a second very broad thing is, is getting back on board the public-private uh, collaboration piece. I think it's hugely important because you know, there's a lot of justifiable criticism out there in the world that you know, governments do things um, without stakeholder engagement, uh, without you know, making decisions, without that sort of input. I think the degree to which we can really partner with companies and get back to what APEC, I think, did very effectively in the past uh, and really um, engage the private sector all year long, but not just big companies, also small and medium-sized enterprises, and also other stakeholders. I think that's hugely important. Uh, and so to the degree we've been able to have a good program on that, I think it'll be a, have been a successful APEC. Um, but third, on the outcome side, I, I do think when you look across, you know, sustainability, digital, economic resiliency, kind of this, um, you know, sequencing of, of things, I mean, those are the topics that everybody's talking about out in the region. And so if we can deliver some outcomes, some of which will be uh, agreements that we make as governments, um, you know, among the APEC economies, some of which might be together with the private sector outcomes that we can announce uh, you know, I think that that will be um, tremendously important as well. And so if we can, again, use this opportunity to show U.S. leadership, to engage stakeholders, and to deliver some specific outcomes, I think it will have been a successful APEC. Thanks. And the, the public-private partnership part that you've emphasized is, of course, really important. And, and one of APEC's traditions is the CEO Summit. Can you explain to me, maybe everybody else here already knows, how that 
ties in to the leaders' meeting and the agreements, um, or is it really a separate, uh, separate entity? Yeah. So the CEO summit is an official part of the APEC Leaders Week program, and you know it's also the one real public-facing piece of the the APEC Leaders Week program. So, um, you know, one of the sort of traditions there is that many of the leaders. Uh, we'll go over to the CEO summit to give speeches or to do uh, panel discussions or um, to really engage with uh, the business community there. Um, you know, I was, uh, I remember back in 2011 when uh, the Leaders Week was in Honolulu and the CEO summit was just this very, you know, dynamic and engaging place where, you know, I saw President Obama being interviewed by the CEO of Boeing and, and all of the discussion that happened as a result of that, but also saw, you know, below the leaders level, a lot of, you know, ministers and vice ministers and senior officials and others who were able to basically go over to the CEO summit and engage with the, the business community and have a real like back and forth, um, which also could involve things like announcing commercial deals or um, announcing specific uh, outcomes. Um, when I came uh, for a pre-advanced visit in, in January uh, and we were going over at Moscone Center, you know, my one and only talking point from the U.S. senior official perspective was we need to make sure that the CEO summit is right next to the leader, where the leaders and ministers are. You know, it can't be a 45-minute drive through traffic to get there, right? Um, it needs to be right side by side. So um, with huge thanks to the city and to everybody involved, um, we now have a situation where leaders are literally going to be able to walk across the street in order to engage the, the business community um, over there uh, at Moscone West where the CEO summit will be. And so, you know, we also want to, in, in a very American kind of way, we also want to see what else we can add to the program. And so we have this uh, proposal to hold a sustainable future forum where we can get uh, companies and um, leaders and ministers from the APEC economies uh, together to talk about uh, work that they, we can do collaboratively to advance sustainability in the region. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, it's great that Monica is here from NC APEC. Her team is really... Uh, putting together uh, the CEO summit, and um, it'll be a tremendous opportunity, I think, to showcase a lot of the uh, innovations in the United States and around the region, and um, to be a very, um, I think, uh, vibrant, dynamic uh, place where uh, the business community and, and government officials can come together and uh, engage on these issues. On the issues of sustainability, and particularly things like climate change, um, on on the you know the UN-led process. Um, you know, hugely important issue. They they tend to get, I should, I don't want to use the word bogged down, but they tend to spend a lot of time focused on who's going to pay. In the discussions at APEC, are you finding that, or is it much more looking at it from sort of a technical, regulatory, technology point of view? Yeah, I think every once in a while we can get uh, stuck on the issue of who's going to pay. I think every once in a while we could get stuck on the issue of APEC is not a climate negotiating body, so don't start talking about the COP or the UNFCCC or 1.5 degrees or whatever. Um, but what has really struck me over the last year and a half is just how much people are talking about climate in APEC. Um, when I previously worked on APEC in 2011 and 2012, nobody talked about climate change in APEC. It just wasn't a topic. Um, but I remember my first meeting, uh, which was virtual last year, that Thailand hosted, and pretty much every single senior official um, uh, including China, including many of the others, all talking about uh, climate change and the importance of doing something about it. I think for us in APEC, and I think Thailand did a great job last year of paving the way with the biocircular green economy, is to try to figure out, all right, so what are the ways in which APEC can be helpful um, through technical exchanges, through various you know, lines of effort and all of that? I think that's, uh, that's important. Okay. I'm, get, I'm being told we're going to start the real Q&A now, which involves, I had one more question, but we'll, we'll skip it and, and get to uh, folks from the audience. Um, yes. I have a question. Hi. Please, please identify yourself when oh, you ask a question. Okay. Uh, I'm Q-Ling, Carolyn Valverde, and I 
Um, I'm a professor of Asian American Studies at UC Davis and the director of the New Vietnam Studies um, initiative there. And so yourself and um, Ms. Um, um, Muduroglu mentioned that about the dense population of Asian Americans um, in San Francisco and the Bay Area in general. And so my question is, what has APEC done in terms of outreach um, in, and or even your hopes of engaging the diaspora here in a meaningful discussion, particularly around local and global trade, as well as rejuvenation of ethnic enclaves and revitalization of ethnic economies? No, thanks. I mean, I think first of all, um, one of the real features of the United States that we really do want to highlight as we host APEC is the is the diaspora, and you know, it, you know, of course, the Asian American diaspora, but also uh, the Latino American uh, diaspora because of some of the economies that are in Peru and Chile and, and Mexico as well. Um, and uh, actually, just before this uh, this meeting. I was at the, the San Francisco uh, Chamber of Commerce talking to a group of AAPI uh, small business leaders, uh, and we want to look for more opportunities to do that. Um, I was uh, also meeting uh, just a couple weeks ago with the Asian American Chamber in uh, the Washington, D.C. area uh, to talk to them about uh, different ways that we should think about um, making sure that we fully engage the AAPI community. Um, so that's going to have to be, you know, continue to be a priority for us. And I think that um, one of the things that we found this year in hosting in other cities is uh, for a lot of our APEC counterparts, they haven't been in the United States in a long time. And they haven't really thought about some of the kind of challenges and opportunities that we're facing here at home. And so I think that it's been a great opportunity to showcase to all of them the kind of diversity that we have here, the kinds of diaspora groups that we have here, um, and the kinds of uh, just you know the, the the unique culture that we uh, I think sometimes take for granted in the United States, and so um, we want to continue to work with uh, the AAPI community and other groups um, to make sure that we're you know engaging uh, as many folks as possible in that process, and also look ahead to uh, the San Francisco Leaders Week and see how there might be ways that we can also expose many of our our guests from uh, the region. Uh, to that very rich and uh, dynamic culture that we have here in the Bay Area. Good. Next question? Yes, over here. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm John Zarabel, and I teach international studies at the University of San Francisco. Because I'm a professor, I spend a lot of time thinking about what the next generation is going to do and how they're going to get involved with these processes, which seem to many of my students a bit far away. Um, but suddenly, we have APEC coming to San Francisco next semester, and it seems like an exciting opportunity. I wonder if you've thought at all, in terms of your community engagement initiatives, about students and having um, opportunities for them to engage and participate with APEC. Yeah, great. I mean, we've thought a lot about students and about um, trying to involve uh, students from around, um, you know, around the area, uh, and that may come in this in the form of volunteer opportunities. Um, you can uh, you can have a lot of ambassadors uh, around, but uh, it's really that volunteer who can point uh, someone from another country in the right direction uh, that becomes the real ambassador, right? So I think there's a lot of different ways that that we can work, and we'll work with the city very closely on on how we can um, you know, help with that. I think the other thing, one of my key takeaways from the last couple days in my visit here is that um, you know, I think we need to continue to think about the materials that we need to produce, um, which can kind of you know, meet that group uh, in terms of uh, you know, what, they, what they might want to know, what they might need to know uh, in engaging uh, younger people, uh, students, whether college students or high school students or elementary school students. And so that's something that we want to th think about as well. Um, and this is something I reflect on a lot because I was a 20-year-old college student and I wanted to do an internship overseas and I had visions of London and Paris in my, my head and my professor uh, at that time told me that he had a wonderful opportunity for me in Jakarta, Indonesia. Um, and I went to the cafeteria that night and asked my friends, do you know where Indonesia is? Because <laughs> I'm going to be living there. Um, but of course, that changed the trajectory of my life, right? And so I certainly personally think that that's important. And we need to do a lot more thinking about how we can ensure that those kinds of opportunities are out there for the other 20-year-olds or, uh, or even younger. If I might just, uh, just add to that, uh, I think 
it's a really important point that uh, whether it's APAC, certainly for APAC, but for a lot of other initiatives, one of the things sometimes government people and I'm a recovering one myself, um, struggle with is, you know, we're, we're so busy doing our stuff and then trying to figure out how do you present that, communicate what we're doing in a way that makes sense to people in general, but certainly to, uh, to younger people. So it's a really good, a really good point. Yes, sir. Just on that very point, would there be space in some of these meetings to invite students? So I think for, I mean, it, it will depend on which meeting we're talking about and, and well, sort of, you know, I mean, yeah. So no, but I think uh, there's a lot of opportunities at the, you know, the CEO summit and, and other places uh, where things are happening where we might be able to uh, include some students. We have done that at a lot of the other uh, APEC events that we've had around the country um, where we've been able to bring students in. Uh, for example, in, um, in Honolulu uh, and, and also in Palm Springs and Detroit. So uh, we want to figure out ways that we can do that. Um, obviously, everything gets a little bit more complicated when you get to the leaders level and you get to security and you get to all of those logistics and all of that. But we do want to make it a priority to have this be a, you know, an event where uh, it can be as accessible as possible. We've got a few minutes left. Yes, There's a question back here. Potash. And uh, I actually have three questions. So one about are you in addressing at all the issue of indigenous populations? And two, um, as a new senior official, you have your official remit and then you have your personal remit. And I wanted to know what your ch major objectives are as you approach this, this job and this event. And then, additionally, what about the jacket? What, the, for the leaders? the leaders? Yeah, I don't know about the last one yet. <laughs> that's that's going to partially be up to the White House. And for those of you who aren't, yeah, who aren't familiar, APEC has been known over the years for you know special shirts, jackets, uh, et cetera. So um, there's there's lots of people I think thinking on that one right now. Um, so I think. Uh, um, and then you just threw me uh, with that last question. <laughs> the first question was about indigenous people. Okay. Um, so look, thank you for asking that. That's been a really important priority for us uh, over the last uh, you know couple of years. Um, you know, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, and a few other economies in APEC have really been focused on making sure that indigenous peoples are also you know included in uh, all of the APEC engagement. And um, you know, every single economy in APEC has a different view on indigenous peoples and different uh, you know ethnic and racial minorities. And so, one of the catch-all terms that's been used is uh, you know uh, people with untapped economic potential. Um, and that's been used APEC wide, but we're not very satisfied with that because we don't feel like that uh, really defines who we're talking about. So we've really been pushing in a lot of diplomatic negotiations and in statements and things um, to account for what we mean by you know groups with untapped economic potential. And we were very pleased last year that in a number of the APEC statements we could include indigenous peoples uh, in that you know in that as well. Uh, we've also been very intentional in our host year so far about including indigenous groups. So we invited a number of native Hawaiians to speak at our events in Hawaii. Um, we also invited um, uh, a Native American uh, tribe to participate in our uh, events in Palm Springs. And so we want to continue to do that. And we're in discussions with some of the other economies about doing uh, some sort of indigenous people's focused event um, uh, later this year. So um, hopefully there'll be more on that. Um, and I think, like in terms of the the career versus the you know and the and the personal remit, um, you know, it, for me, it's just a tremendous honor and privilege to be in this position. Um, you know, if you could have told me 20 years ago this would get what I would get to do, I, I wouldn't have believed you, right? Um, so to be able to uh, be able to advance all of these policies and and to try to work with our interagency, to work with the business community, to work with all of our partners around the region. Um, is incredibly, you know, fulfilling and rewarding, and you know, I think even, uh, you know, really fun. And so, I think to be able to do that and to be in in this opportunity where we're hosting is really uh, terrific. So, um, there's still a lot of work to be done, and we have a great team um, that's very focused on that. But uh, 
you know, I think, yeah, we want to, we want to deliver some positive outcomes, but we also want to make sure we, we do it the right way that we include all of our communities and stakeholders around the country as much as possible. Um, and that we also demonstrate uh, to the region that the United States can show uh, leadership in organizations like APEC. Thanks. I, if we have time for one really quick last question. Yes. AT&T business family in China, international long distance. So um, what the uh, business reporters, global finance and um, uh, trade people will write about and talk about is the comparison of um, APEC, which I heard the rumor that Australia started it originally, but with RCEP, could you speak to whether this is going to try to be a competitive or complementary kind of global arrangement? Well, I think one of APEC's strengths uh, over the years has been that it's been trying to promote uh, you know, trade and investment around the region. And so there are a number of different regional uh, groupings on trade, whether that's RCEP or CPTPP. Um, of course, now the Biden administration has also launched the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Uh, and in some cases, there's overlapping memberships between APEC and some of these you know, various uh, arrangements. And so I think from the APEC perspective, uh, you know, we don't see that as being competing, um, but we do see it as you know, uh, the more uh, trade and investment um, you know, opportunities there are for the region, the better. Uh, I do think that one important way, and this might get to, I know S Scott maybe had a question on this area, I think one really important way that things are shifting, uh, both here at home and in the APEC region as well, is that it, you know, I think the growing view that it can't just be about uh, opening up trade and investment or, or reducing tariffs, but it also does have to include, you know, trade agreements have to look at, um, you know, how do you um, include the digital economy, how do you make sure that your focused on sustainability and inclusion, how do you make sure that you're focused on uh, workers? And I know that was a big uh, theme of the discussion we had at the, the ministers responsible for trade meeting in Detroit in, in May that uh, Ambassador Catherine Tai led. And so um, I think we have to look at trade and investment very holistically in that sense. And so I think the degree that which APEC can be a platform that can support that, but also can work alongside all of these other trading arrangements, uh, I think, is, is what we're looking to do. Great. I think, unfortunately, we're out of time. So, Matt, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for your great questions. And thanks to Asia Society for organizing. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Matt, Scott, and Miriam. Um, we at Asia Society are ready for you. So just say the word. There was a question online virtually if we are going to do an APEC 301 event, and probably we will, and it may even take place in Seattle, so stay tuned for that. We are also, you heard about the CEO Summit, we are gonna be doing a big event around that November 15th or 16th at the Asia Society, so stay tuned for that. We'll be posting information on our website. Thank you again to Chevron for this event, and we do want your feedback. Uh, there will be a QR code up on the slide there if you have a moment to take a brief uh, survey for us, that would be helpful. Thank you very much to our very hardworking team, Nina, Christy, Mon, Jeremy, Aaron, and all of our student interns and volunteers. We can't do it without you. Let's hear it for them, please. <laughs> Upcoming events, and we are hosting them in San Francisco, in Silicon Valley, in Seattle, and also online. We have an executive roundtable this Friday with Jessica Chen Weiss, who's going to talk about everything the latest on China. That's going to be uh, Friday in San Francisco. We're also going to do that in person in Seattle on July 6. We're going to host a roundtable on AI and China. That is coming up in July. The State Department has a group of foreign correspondents that are coming out. We're also going to host them and have some speakers. Some of our ambassadors that are in our network are going to speak. And of course, the big APEC event. So if you are not a member, please join us. And thank you very much again for being here.